everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Power of Nine podcast. I am your host, Aaron Eggert. Today's guest has built a storied career helping businesses large and small with all the fun legal aspects of growth and change. We're going to learn all about that and a lot more with my guest, Scott Seiler. Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks, Aaron. Thrilled to be here. Yeah, awesome. I, uh, I'm super pumped to have you in the show. We've gotten to know each other pretty well over the last six months to a year uh, with some mutual friends and stuff. Uh, you're, uh, you're a member of the Coalition 9 community, which I'm very honored to have you as a member of that. It's always great to have somebody as an attorney as a part of the community because everybody could use a little bit of legal help. And so uh, sharing your story with our listeners is going to be fantastic today. Good. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, handing out that free information without billing is always a treat. <laughs> <laughs> As it is. You told me that as part of the deal at the beginning. So uh, I know that. Uh, okay. Bef before we dig in, uh, could you share with us what your pronouns are? Uh, he, him. All right. Awesome. So I am going to dig in just from uh, the get-go from your, your childhood, because a lot of how you've approached uh, law and uh, running your own businesses has been informed by the way that you were brought up uh, with not only your father, but your your family. And so talk a little bit about that experience growing up and, and the impact that your family had on, on you and how you approach business. Yeah, I, I think that's very true. Um, I was born and raised in Duluth uh, into a family of um, business folks. We had a retail jewelry store in downtown Duluth started in the early 1920s, uh, passed through three generations, and uh, then it, we ran out of generations, so it sold a few years ago. Um, but uh, it was a, a very successful high-end jewelry store, but everything was discounted. Uh, and it was just an expectation uh, that the children, uh, the spouses, we'd all be, when needed, at the store. Um, and I would say in my case, I was probably there even when I wasn't wanted, uh, but showed up anyway. Um, yeah. And, you know, it, it, I think there's two things, maybe three things that came out of that for me. Number one is the concept that respect doesn't have a hierarchy. And you mm -hmm. and I've talked about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't always play well in the professional game. Uh, you know, there's certainly a hierarchy in the office. There's got to be a boss, but, you know, everybody should be respected the same. Um, and that's something I learned from my father, watching him, you know, wait on somebody who may be buying a several thousand dollar diamond and uh, a gentleman who had very little uh, would come in looking just for a watch battery and, and he'd leave the people with the diamond to help the person with the watch battery. You know, those mm -hmm. types of things just get ingrained in your, in your brain. Um, and so that, that would be one. Uh, the second is that there's no task that's too small or below me. It, there was nothing I wasn't called on to do. As a matter of fact, I was probably making my first sale by the time I was 10 years old or so. And I'm talking... <laughs> Big sales. Um, turned 16, father handed me the keys to a car. Great. I became the delivery boy. I didn't see the front of the store again for three years. So uh, that's what it was in the store. And, you know, in the mornings, we all got there and uh, someone had to grab the vacuum. Somebody had to dust the, the top of the high thing. Now, one of the problems we had was my father was six foot four. So he could run his hand across the top of the tall cases and you know, yeah, yeah. work out, someone get this dusted. Um, so th those were definitely things, uh, great lessons um, that I learned uh, while I was there. And the other thing was, it's okay to give a little something away. Um, you know, it, it's, if you know much about retail, it's a little different than end cap space at Target, but when you come right. in, you see the bling right? Because, yeah. oh, great, you need your watch changed, your band changed, that's fine, but you're going to have to walk past everything else first. For sure. um, but we were a discount store. We always gave a little something away, uh, sometimes a lot away. And those lessons came with me into law. I never intended to become a lawyer. I intended to go back to Duluth and run the store. Um, that all changed when my uh, older brother of 10 years moved back to Duluth and I was, you know, for lack of a better term, given a pink slip. <laughs> so, get out of here, go live somewhere else. Um, 
there's better, more robust places for, for you out there. So yeah. um, that's why I went to law school because that's what all my friends were doing. Uh, but when it came time to actually work um, and get in it, I, I didn't quite understand this all holy billable hour routine. Um, I, I didn't get why you couldn't knock a little something off if you felt you did a little too much work. And it, it really changed my perspective on how to bill. Um, the other piece was how to treat the clients. And that was just a natural, when you're in retail, you're always on. You know, if you mm -hmm. go out to dinner and you see somebody who's a customer or a prospective customer, you're on, you're, you're in the, you know, how you do in mode. Um, and I brought that with me also. And so that's, you know, if you're going to say, is there a differentiator with what I do and other attorneys? I don't know. Um, but for me, it's all about the relationship. And that's what I grew up learning. Yeah. And I think that's the, in my experience, that's the difference between being owning your own practice versus being at, at a, a larger firm where, you know, hourly billable hours are so highly scrutinized and you've got, you know, a myriad of resources. So you got to make sure that you're using your time on, on the best clients or the highest paying clients, blah, 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 where you have the opportunity now to build this and shape it however you want. And that to me is like the essence of being an entrepreneur. I think you're right. And I think one of the problems with sustainability with that platform, not that the big firms aren't making it, they have no problem, but right. I, I would question the nature of the relationships uh, the attorneys have with their clients. Um, and are they, you know, truly friendship based relationships? Uh, are they, are they building something real or is it just, business, we're your attorneys, yes, you trust us when you need us to do legal things, or is it really a relationship? And that to yeah. me is the differentiator. Yeah. So you talked about your your brother being much older, and I know that uh, you had a sister that was older. So um, you've mentioned to me in the past that it was interesting brother sister relationship with them because it was almost more like a mentorship relationship. And I thought that was a, a, a great way uh, to look at it in a great perspective, share with us a little bit more about, about that relationship that you had with them and how that helped shape you. Yeah. I mean, my brother's 10 years older, my sister eight. You know, so by the time I was really sort of functioning, they were gone. <laughs> they were mm -hmm. out of the house mm -hmm. at college, working, whatever it was. And they both left Duluth. Um, and so I was kind of a single child uh, growing up, but they'd come back into life um, over and over again, it, it wasn't like they were absent. Mm -hmm. Maybe it came off wrong, but my sister was at school in Madison, and you know it was not unusual for me to go there for a weekend uh, or a long weekend and hang out with her and stay and you know be taken care of uh, while we did whatever was going on in Madison. Um, my brother would come home. I, I I went out to see him a few times. He lived out west. And, uh, he is very adventuresome, a uh, ton of fun, but he'd do things like come home and without telling me, throw me in the car and say, hey, it's, uh, it was 1981. I remember specifically, he said, come on, we're going to go to the North Star uh, Stanley Cup game against the Islanders. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, for a guy who's 10 years older and really doesn't need to do much with me, that's how I was treated. Um, and yeah. so there was a lot of, in our family, there were very few words, but a lot of deeds. And you had to learn from the deeds and, you know, kind of pick through, there was good and bad, right? But um, yeah. pick through the positive. And uh, I, I will lack to both of them. I, I have an incredibly um, deep love for music. Uh, it's all over the board uh, in terms of genres. And that's for my brother. Um, yeah. When I was eight or nine, I was reading a, a book. I, I remember, I've still got the darn book. It was a, a glossy <laughs> hardcover, about 20 page book about Bobby Orr. And my brother came and said, put that junk away, start reading something real, threw me a Stephen King book. And I've been hooked <laughs> on reading ever since. So That's great. You know, it's, again, it wasn't talk in our house. It was deed. Do you, uh, were you a huge North Stars fan? Huge. Who's your yeah. favorite North Star? You know, it's okay. T give me it's three. gotta be it's Dino. I mean, I love Cicerelli yeah, right. you know, yeah. during the playing days, not the extracurriculars. Yeah. Yeah. I was just checking over my nine questions for you in the future here. I was making sure that there's nothing music related and there's not. So, okay. uh, so Good. I, 
share with me a little bit more the the you know the, if you're you got a passion for music what is your go-to uh stuff to listen to um you know because if you do run the gamut there's going to be certain times that you're going to be in certain moods but um if you're in a if you're in a deep let's just do this if you're in a deep thought mood and you're you're um are you the type of person that works with music in the background music or or netflix depends yeah <laughs> but I, I like the white noise yeah. um working is tchaikovsky always hmm. uh, in the background i i don't even care what i just turn it on um yeah. working out green day or link uh lincoln park one of the Sweet. two you do have a good eclectic. Heck yeah. Uh, you know, fun is almost any punk band from the 70s. And then I like a lot of country too. So sweet. What what kind of country? Old country or new country? Um, oh God, this is where people are just gonna hang up there. Uh, <laughs> uh Dwight Yoakum. Um, oh no, that's you 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 and I are like kindred spirits in that respect. I'm George Jones, Waylon Jennings, okay. and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Waylon, like the, the old stuff. Lily, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those things I rarely turn it on myself, but if it's on and someone reaches to turn it off, I'm like, are you crazy? Do you know who this is? Uh, yeah. Love Buddy Holly was sort of my my first taste of uh, 50s rock. So, yeah, it runs Sweet. again. Sweet. Good. Uh, all right. Uh, so the other thing I that probably or I know has shaped a lot of who you are is you've dealt with a myriad of health challenges and, uh, and you shared that with me and uh, during our prep call a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, Holy smokes. So we definitely need to jump into this. Um, so, so let's dig in the, the health challenges you deal with are primarily around your heart. Uh, and I'd like you to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I was born with congenital heart disease, um, essentially a, a bad pulmonary valve. And uh, it needs to be replaced every now and then, every 10 to 15 years or so. Uh, nice. but, the, but the warranty you get. Um, <laughs> unfortunately for me, uh, technology was still in its infancy when I was in my infancy. And so yeah. they need to crack my chest every time they do something. Mm. We're hoping the fifth time, which should be in about 12 to 15 years, um, they'll be able to do it with a catheter, but, uh, yeah. so it, you know, it, it gives you a bit of humble, <laughs> humble pie, uh, yeah. going through that. I, I always said, I'd like to write a book that everyone should have open heart surgery. It gives you a little different yeah. perspective. And the problem is I think like with everything else, that perspective can fade, you know, a few years after. So I'll, I'll, you know, I'm not working out quite as hard as I should be right now. You're right. Um, you know, I'm not quite as thankful or have the gratitude maybe I should all the time that I maybe I had a, my last one was in 2019 so maybe in 220 or 2020 I had a little different attitude um but it, it's I can reflect on it um yeah. and I'm blessed I I it's plumbing that's really all it is and it's it's it hurts it's not a lot of fun um but it is again it's just part of my life uh, my parents growing up, never let me use it as an excuse, except for swimming in junior high. I was able to use it for that. <laughs> wasn't wasn't oh, really interested great. in that game. Um, yeah. But it's, you know, it just is what it is. I played every sport poorly. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, th there was just no saying no because of the heart situation. So when you had your surgery in 2019, um, what was, what's recovery like on something like that? Well, there's a right way and a wrong way. Um, <laughs> and the right way is essentially three months post-surgery recovery. Uh, so the day I was only in the hospital for four days. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, when you, by the time you get home, maybe you can walk for two or three minutes before you're exhausted. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's other, you can't use your arms, you know, there's all sorts of other things, but after about a month and a half, you know, I was walking, you know, three miles a day, twice a day. Mm -hmm. And on my one year anniversary, I went on a 23 mile bike ride. So, um, but I went all three months. I didn't work, just yeah. kept my head down and, you know, did the program as they say. Yeah. Right. Focus on your health. Right. Right. Yeah. 
So good. Yeah. So I got to believe that that, you know, just even going back to the way that you approach business, I look at these two things that are, have shaped you, right? Like this whole influence of your family and your father and the way that he approached business from a, from a, um, just a relationship standpoint, but then just the, like, you know, your term of humble pie of, of, you know, the, the health challenges thing is I look at those as being the two kind of pillars of what you've had to, uh, help shape you moving into the future. And, and that is really the whole essence of what the attitude is of how you approach your firm. I think there's a lot to that. There's also the influence of those who played roles, yeah. you know, like you talked about my brother, my sister, my dad, you know, my wife and kids uh, all did. This was a family run store. There would be 15 family members there over the uh, winter Christmas season, you know, doing yeah. one thing or the other. So it, it, a lot of that was impactful within those two things. Um, again, keeping me humble. You don't get to use anything as an excuse and teaching lessons. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, how many kids you got? I've got four. You have four kids. Wow. Uh, and, uh, any at home? Uh, I have two at home seniors in high school, yep. um, yep. boy and a girl twins. Uh, and, um, we'll see last year was, uh, challenging for everybody, yeah. them included. Um, I have a daughter who's at school in Boston in her junior year. And then I have a child in uh, California uh, who teaches special ed at an elementary school. Fantastic. Yeah. And we just talked about the shenanigans that you just had to go through to go out and make that visit. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. I'm not even going to get into that with that because I don't want, I, I don't want to want to deal with the anguish that, uh, that you would have to put our listeners through. So, but fact of the matter is that you've always got something going on. Well, and if nothing else, we can do the next podcast on the hotel I had to stay in. <laughs> <laughs> right. That could be a whole podcast episode itself. Yes. Oh yes. yeah. So, uh, all right. So I want to dig into your career a little bit. So you, you alluded to the fact that, uh, so you went to the U of M for undergrad and then you went to Hamlin for law school. What was your first gig uh, related to the legal uh, industry? Uh, I was a, a law clerk when I was in law school for a small firm uh, in Minneapolis. Um, that was very interesting because they did everything. So mm -hmm. there were times when I was serving process. I remember going into a cab company and having to serve somebody with a lawsuit there and getting chased uh, out, yeah. um, writing memos, uh, going to court with the attorneys. That's really where it started. Um, I also worked uh, for the dean of the law school for a couple summers, maybe just one summer. Um, and he was a labor arbitrator. So that was kind of fun driving around the state, watching him arbitrate cases. Uh, then after law school, I worked for a judge for a year and a half in Hennepin County District Court, um, and that was fantastic experience. I, I had that, the yeah. one judge in the court system who thought th that this was all about, this job was all about seeing what happens in the courtroom, so you knew what to do when you got out of there. Um, so mm -hmm. he didn't stick me in the library all day long. Uh, he had me right next to him learning. He also yeah. had me buying him cigars and getting him... <laughs> You know his laundry, but uh, he's a, a dear man and a good friend. We, we just lost him, and it's it's sad yeah. for the whole community. But and the character, and he he was hysterical, he, a right. prankster. Um, after that, I went and worked for a small firm of great people, and I lasted six months before I realized I really don't work well for others. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the entrepreneur side of you, right? Like right. Uh, plays well with others in the right situations. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah. and the truth was, I had no idea what I was doing, right? I had never intended to practice even when I was in law school. So here I am going, well, I don't know how this works. Um, yeah. and so it was, it was stressful, but we, we all got along fine and the transition was pretty easy. Yeah. Did, uh, so what did you do after six? So you, you stuck it out for six months. You, you got, you, I had to believe you probably after a month were like, okay, this is not my jam, but you've stuck it out just out of the, out of respect. I'm sure something like that. Right. No, I, <laughs> I actually couldn't figure out what was wrong in my head. Right. I was going through this. <laughs> what was wrong with you? Yeah. Why okay, do I gotcha. hate this? Why do I, you know, what's yeah. going on? Finally, someone said, 
get out of there. Everything in your life is fantastic, but that, get rid of that. Don't be a hero. Um, and so, uh, it, and it was clear to them um, that I wasn't real thrilled. So, and I don't think they were that thrilled with me. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> so it worked out mutual. great. Yeah, it usually is mutual in situations like that. Yep. All right, so, uh, so after you parted ways with them, what did you do then? Uh, hung my own shingle um, together with a, a shirt tail relative. And I practiced criminal defense for about eight years. Uh, private side criminal defense, mostly felony work, um, high end stuff, tried murder case uh, to conclusion. Wow. Um, some other nasty cases <laughs> that you just wow. get in position. And I really, I liked it. Um, I enjoyed what I was doing. There was a change in 2000 or so in the court system um, that made our model very difficult to maintain uh, mm. in terms of how we got our clients. Um, and so we, uh, and, and then I had surgery that year, one of my four and woke mm -hmm. up from surgery and went, what am I doing? I, I know business. That's, you know, I understand retailers and retail. Uh, mm -hmm. So I took six months off, got a part-time goofy little job while I learned how to do uh, employment law, how to create LLCs, S corps, all of that. And, uh, you know, still had the shingle hung and just reverted and started working on that type of uh, thing and grew it and grew it. Yeah. Was it hard for you to kind of, um, I even, you know, regardless of what anybody does, trying to reestablish their personal brand of being uh, in, you know, private criminal defense and then going back into business and, and getting that notoriety of, of who you are on the business side of things. Was that a, was that a challenge? Yeah. You know, I went from, knowing the jailers, because that's where I'd right. find my clients, they were all in jail on major felonies, to right. where, where do you find people? Uh, and I got lucky. I, I called my brother. I said, anyone you think I should talk to down here? And he said, here, call this, again, shirt towel relative of ours, called him. He said, I know some guy that owns an insurance agency, maybe he'll help. And for about three years, that was uh, my saving grace. Uh, the the guy was great. He gave me somewhere to office. He gave me work and he referred his clients to me for employment cool. law. Uh, and then I happened to be at a wedding in New York. Uh, and uh, you know, another person who was in the wedding said, yeah, I could actually use some contract work. Uh, that Both of those have been clients since 2001 wow. um, without stop and really instrumental to allowing me to build the practice. Yeah. Do you, the, so you alluded earlier that you just have a passion for retail and, and that's uh, because of your, your roots. Do you, do you work with any type of businesses or what, what, what do you, what do you have any type of like target markets or specialties or anything like that? that or is it, are you pretty agnostic when it comes to the types of businesses you work with? I don't know if I've ever thought of this as agnostic. I'm going to use that. Um, yeah. I, I, I draw a pretty wide path with represent. So I've got manufacturing companies, retailers, a lot of franchisees, um, up in uh, medical clinics, mm. all over the place, um, financial services companies. Mm. What I do translates well to almost every industry. I mean, sometimes I got to get in and learn the regulations to make things work. Uh, a lot of nonprofit work right now is big. Mm. Um, so it's pretty wide. What I like to do is any business transaction from large scale merger and acquisition to, hey, let's just start a little LLC, you know, yeah. everything in between, all the contracts, all the corporate documents, the meetings, whatever needs to be done. I love the employment law piece for employers. Um, I think there's a lot that employers can do uh, to protect themselves and learn how to handle their HR um, in a very effective means, especially a smaller company that might not know what the rules and regulations are. Yep. Uh, and then I do a lot of um, commercial real estate deals, buying, selling, and leasing uh, either side, landlord or tenant. So those almost always come together in every industry. You know, yeah. you always need to lease somewhere to work. You always need to make sure your corporate documents are up. Okay. You know, there's always somebody calling saying, I'm not getting along with my partner. I want to do a buyout. And then people calling, you know, thank goodness every day saying, Hey, we're going to buy a company or we're going to sell a company. Uh, yeah. And all of that to me is really a lot of fun. I, I, I enjoy that. 
There's some things I don't enjoy. I don't love the litigation. So I have other people do that. Uh, yeah. But the, that transactional work, I get a kick out of. Yeah. And you've, so the, the firm that you had before you have Siler Law now, um, you, you grew that to be a pretty good size and, and uh, you hung, uh, you came together with a partner on that, but then uh, had a little bit of like a partnership divorce there too, so that you, yeah. you've been through it yourself. Um, share with me a little bit about that experience that, that uh, coming together growing something and then you making the decision uh, or mutually making the decision that it's just not the right fit? Um, a lot of that, I would say, dates back to what we talked about earlier with my sort of retail evaluation yeah. of how to do business. Um, we were 11 attorneys strong, maybe half a dozen clerical paralegal strong. Um, and I'm still running around like a solo practitioner, right? Mm -hmm. Making rain, which is great. One of my jobs was to bring in business, um, but I wasn't the guy to, to sit around at um, three o'clock and have a cocktail with everybody, which is important on a Friday. It's a really important part of the game. I'm, I'm out sniffing out what's next or uh, dealing with a client uh, who had an issue. And so it was really sort of that you know, we'd become the size of a firm where we probably did have to operate more as a traditional firm. And I just mm -hmm. didn't necessarily fit that mold and probably caused a lot of chaos <laughs> right, right, in that realm. Right. On the other hand, this is what I want to do and how I want to do it. It's how I build my relationships. It's, it's how I become successful. And so yeah, it was, it was a mutual agreement. Um, yeah. And, you know, we, we had some long discussions about uh, staying going, what to do. I reached out, uh, this is the beauty of something like Coalition 9, by the way. There wasn't a Coalition 9 yet. I had some others. Right, right. But yeah. I, mean, I called somebody who was in a peer group I was in. Uh, they were in Italy and called me back to counsel me. Um, right. I called half a dozen other people locally. You know, We all went out one-on-one -on -one to lunch, heard what they had to say. It, it was great. It was a, almost a seamless transition, except for COVID. Yeah. That, that didn't help. But right. Um, right. So I, I, I hope there's no animosity um, from the old firm. I don't think there is. I have none for right. them. They're uh, tremendous people and good attorneys. Yeah. Yeah. So that experience uh, and, and having gone through that, plus probably, um, you know, all the different times that you've realized as an entrepreneur, you don't quote unquote play well with others or you do in the right situations. How is that going to uh, make change your mindset, or how are you going to approach your firm and uh, and your career moving forward? Um, it's a great question. I have withheld uh, from looking for another firm to join. I have a very portable book. Um, I think it would be attractive to several firms, but that's not happening. I don't want to get involved in the politics and everything I see, not only from my own experiences, but watching friends uh, who've been involved. Um, so it's going to be incredibly strategic. Uh, it's going to be planned well, uh, which is why nothing's happened yet. Because between yeah. COVID and the phone ringing, I really haven't had a chance to strategize. Uh, and yeah. that's my hope for, the, you know, what's the next step is, all right, what is the strategy? Um, with one exception, there will probably be an announcement before the end of the year of a merger with a small firm that's I will absorb um, just because we've been working together for about five years anyway. It makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, but we have, uh, we have all the systems in place. It's really a matter of finding the right match. And then what's the strategy behind that? So, yeah. uh, you know, it doesn't take a genius to read the internet or the newspaper and see how hard it is to hire right now. It's absolutely the same with attorneys. It's very hard to find attorneys, um, especially ones who you say, by the way, I operate a little differently. You know? Yeah. yeah. So. And I think that's going to be really key, right. In, in your growth. And as you add people and know, learning from your previous experience is that be transparent, right. Just be transparent with who you are and, and, yeah. You know, I can sometimes shake things up a little bit and, and I can sometimes be uh, Hurricane Scott, but, uh, but that's all right. That's what makes it rain. Right. 
and it's yeah. yeah and i and i don't think there was anything wrong i think the old firm just developed into you know a bit of a machine yeah um and i just wasn't a great fit as a cog yeah 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 well i uh i think you know you've talked about this in in your coalition nine group and you know i look at those people as kind of your per, and you you even talked about with previous peer groups you're in those people become your personal board of advisors right and so um you're handling it the right way and and you i love the fact that you're being focused and pragmatic about that so um i'm pumped to see what you have brewing uh for some <laughs> announcements and things like that so the timing of this podcast drop in here uh, in the beginning of September, people can keep their, their peepers out on you. Yeah. Now the pressure's on. I actually have to come through. So thanks a lot. <laughs> right. uh, it's all about accountability, brother. Right. <laughs> if I don't do it, who will? Uh, all right. This, huh? Okay. Uh, yeah. I love it. Uh, all right. So I am going to uh, transition into the nine questions. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story, but I want to also ask you, uh, can you confirm to me that you have no idea what I'm about to ask you? I will confirm. All right, good. Are you nervous? No. Okay, good. I, I have a feeling you don't get nervous. I have my moment. Uh, <laughs> all right. All right. Question one, what is the strangest thing that you have ever eaten? So I have a pretty limited palate. Um, Here's what I can tell you. I was in Israel in 1985 uh, in Haifa and befriended a doctor because a friend of mine broke his arm in Israel. And our group leaders gave him the exact same pill they gave the kids who had stomach aches. <laughs> so we said, we go to the hospital. We get to the hospital and the orthopedist who's setting his arm looks at me and goes, boy, you stand funny. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you must have scoliosis, which I do. We didn't talk about the back surgery stuff. Yeah. He said, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Minnesota. He said, oh, do you know Dr. David Bradford? I said, yeah, he was my surgeon. <laughs> like, yeah, I knew him too. Anyway, this guy took us to dinner in Haifa. And we had to walk down, I remember, with three flights of stairs into this basement. It was a seven-course meal. To this day, I have no idea what we ate. It may have been the best meal I ever had. And the next day we both woke up and our mouths were bleeding. <laughs> so I, again, strangest thing I ever ate, no clue. Tasted great. Yeah. For a week made and a me, half, we were in a lot of pain. Yeah. Made me bleed. <laughs> right. and, and they gave us the same pills. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good story. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, you're the first person on this podcast to, that has answered that question with made me bleed. <laughs> Ah, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you got that. You can put that on your, <laughs> under your belt there. Uh, all right. What is the lowest grade that you've ever received and in what class? You're a smart guy. So I'm wondering what this is. You know, well, does like. it, does it count if you drop the class before the grade hit in? Um, I had a D going in microeconomics, but I dropped it before it, it settled and retook the class. Uh, I will tell you, I got a C plus in corporations and law school. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> good thing that was good thing that was a while ago and you've got probably you've shorted yeah. up an experience. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think that's as, as bad as it got. There's probably a All couple right. others in there, but oh. All right. Well we're gonna take the microeconomics one. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, what is your superpower? Um well one of them is just listening to a lyric music and being able to tell you who it was or what the song was on occasion. Uh, yeah, I but I would say in, in, the, in the real world, it, it's, it's not being present. That's an issue, you know, <laughs> whatever situation, <laughs> but I can be there. Um, so uh, my kids need something. I'm there. You saw it. I flew up to California on a whim uh, yep. to help my daughter. And I've done that to Boston uh, before. If, if that's really, and I don't think, I think it's a parent power. I don't think it's necessarily my power, but it's yeah. kind of my mantra. Yeah. Yeah. I don't doubt that, that, that that's probably the same case with your clients, right? Is that you're, you, you got their back and you're there for them. Yeah. You're welcome to call me at two in the morning tonight right. because I will be working. <laughs> 
I know. Well, you, you and I have had call, phone calls at seven o'clock at night because it just doesn't work any other time of the day. <laughs> yeah. I, I get that. That's what it's all about, brother. Uh, all right. Describe yourself in three words. Hungry. Like literally, I'm a, always hungry. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Glad you clarified that. <laughs> okay. Uh, a gracious meaning I have gratitude. I, I you know, I, I know where the good things in life come from and they're not necessarily self-driven. Um, yeah. And I would say um, zealous. You know, I, mm. I get a project and I go all into it. I uh, love it. Yeah, so that's a- Good three choices. Yeah. I love it. Uh, what is one thing that you own that you just wish you didn't? Everything in my garage. <laughs> All right, let's narrow that down to what's the one thing in your garage that you wish you didn't own? Oh, jeez. My rollerblades. Because <laughs> I don't use them. When I do, I fall and hurt myself. Right. That's <laughs> so, a good idea. Put those suckers on eBay or Facebook yeah. Marketplace and move on. Yeah. Uh, what is one guilty pleasure that you indulge in? Oh, late night binging, eating. It's... Really? The joke in our house is save that for midnight. Dad's coming back. I um, love it. And it, well, it's can be a problem, but uh, uh, yeah, right. Yeah, but yeah. it's uh, it, it. I just decide if I'm hungry or I'm feeling the you know, what do they call it? Eat uh, stress eating. Um, yeah, right. You know, right. Fine. I'm yeah. gonna do it. Yeah. So. Is there a special thing that you look forward to eating when you're when you're eating? If there's something you're gonna come into the fridge and know that it's there at midnight anything or is it just anything that's usually that what i'm thinking about is never there when i want it right, <laughs> so, right. You, um your wife no, should buy an abundance of lettuce right right she should. <laughs> that's the crazy thing i mean i'll eat a turkey sandwich and then have a bowl of cereal and you know then i'll eat some carrots it just it doesn't end and i i really don't know that i'm consciously picking anything out right 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 all right uh, interesting. Um, what is the last book you read? Um, Legacy was the last mm -hmm. one I finished. Yeah. And uh, I'm in the middle of, uh, I've got it upstairs even from where I'm at, but I'm in the middle of a book that Stephen King recommended. Um, you can see where I go with my reading genre. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's all right. But it's, it's sensational, but it's so disturbing. I can only read a couple chapters at a time. And I'm the kind right. of person who can sit down and read a book in a day or afternoon really yeah all right well if you think of it and by the time this podcast ends then just drop it and, and throw it out at any given point um okay in one word destri describe the current state of your inbox disheveled <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't surprise me, actually. I had a feeling you were going to say something along those lines, and I, I'm glad you chose that word. That is a very good descriptive word. Uh, 122,000. Right. Oh, my God. Emails. Are you kidding me? In your inbox? Yeah. What? In the, all right. I don't even know I'll where to go it. with that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. We'll get through that. Yeah. I'm sure you will. Uh, all right. What is your go to? For, this is your last question, by the way. What is your go to for inspiration? What gets me um, sort of back on track mm -hmm. uh, is either my bicycle mm -hmm. uh, or the ski hill. Um, and skiing is a huge part of my life. I, I, I'm a ski instructor um, mm -hmm. every weekend. And uh, there's just something about that that kind of resets me. Uh, winter's great because Thursday, I'm starting to think through my lesson plan for the weekend. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. can kind of go there. Um, otherwise, I mean, there's a lot of people that inspire me and, but I don't really say, oh, I, you know, wonder what this person did, or can mm -hmm. I go find a quote? And I feel better. I, I that, mm -hmm. that doesn't work for me. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I'm a little bit solitary that way, yeah. but I just have to dig in and find it. And I think some people have that, uh, that, that, that grounding, uh, that skiing or cycling does for you that is what inspires you because it maybe it's just a way that you can think through whatever's going on in your head or whatever. It's just, it helps you uh, just kind of get everything back on track. Yep. 
And I think, yeah. it's, and I think the, you know, the, not to plug, but coalition nine in some respects, it, it's almost like therapy, right? I, right. I, I'm not dealing with my issues for three hours and I'm, right. you know, getting some training from others and people I can rely on. And I often walk out of those meetings refreshed. Um, yeah. And as good as it is, the bike rides a little better, but. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with that. I'll, I'll actually agree with that statement too. Bike ride is good. Uh, good job, man. You, you made it. And, uh, a couple healthy pauses in there to make sure that you're, you're answering right, but you did a great job. I appreciate that. Thanks for being thoughtful about it. It only took two tries, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, there's a story behind that. We're just going to leave that. We're going to let that lie right there. Uh, all right. Where can our listeners find you? Uh, well, I'm officing in St. Paul and on the other side of the river, I've got offices in St. Louis park too. Uh, yep. best way to reach me is, can I give my email? Yeah. It's just yeah. S Siler at silerlaw.com. If you want to yep. look at our website, it's actually getting a little aged already, but that's just silerlaw.com. And, uh, yep. it's a pretty nice little website we did, but it, it tells you what we do, how we do it. A lot of the faces have changed already, but yeah, um, yep. that's the best way to reach me. Uh, throw me an email. I get back yeah. to you. Okay. I'll put, uh, so people know I will put the uh, Scott's email in our show notes, his website in our show notes. And I am actually going to put your LinkedIn profile in there okay. because you're relatively active on LinkedIn and you comment uh, occasionally. And and I know you're active in there because uh, you like my stuff, which, uh, which that's an indicator that you're there. So <laughs> I'll make sure and put that on there in the show notes. Well, there's There's a lot to like. So uh, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Well, I cannot thank you enough for being on the show. Uh, I've enjoyed becoming uh, friends with you and getting to know you better. I'm obviously very honored that you're part of our community and, uh, and the world's a little bit better place because of you, brother. Well, very kind. And I, I'll tell you, I think the benefits all to me. So uh, it's great. And uh, I look forward to many, many more years. Uh, I appreciate it. On behalf of Scott Seiler, this has been the Power of Nine podcast. I am your host, Aaron Eggert, and I want to thank you for the privilege of your time. Cheers. Thanks.